Where do they come up with these car names? Seltos. What in the world is Seltos? Well, Seltos is an island off the, let's say, Greek peninsula, even though Greece doesn't really have anyway. Uh, the island of Seltos is known for the fact that every moving thing on it has to go on four wheels or, in the case of animals, four legs. That means even human beings on the island of Seltos must walk around on all fours. And this is appropriate for this particular Kia because... It has available all-wheel drive. You see? Four wheels, all-wheel drive. Seltos. Yeah, it's completely made up. I, I just uh, literally made it up right now. Uh, I don't know what Seltos means, but we're going to find out during the course of this video, as well as tell you about this brand new 2024 refresh of a very cool little compact SUV. Shall you get on all fours and come with us? Please do. Friends, would you like to feel refreshed? Well, apparently that's what the Kia Seltos wanted for uh, 2024 year. They have, in fact, done a lot of things to this little compact SUV to make it more appealing, including some changes in horsepower and a little bit changes in styling here and there and just a basic refresh. What does a refresh really mean? Well, it, it's... To put it, I mean, it varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. Some call stuff a refresh when it's just available in another color. But uh, in most cases, it means there's a bunch of tweaks to the existing model without any major overhauls. Uh, in the case of the Seltos, they've done quite a bit for the 2024 model year and made some changes, especially in the drivetrain, that are very nice improvements that I think are going to make this very popular little compact SUV, much more popular. It has a 103.5 inch wheelbase, and not it's not a three row thing, as you may have, <laughs> have, you may have figured out, because if you put a third row in the Seltos, it would be a very tiny uh, third row with little bitty people in it. But this is a, a standard two row compact SUV. It's in a very, very competitive class with your CRVs and your RAV4s and your Tucsons and your Tauses and your, uh, what the heck do they call it? An Eclipse. <laughs> and of course the, the uh, venerable Ford uh, Escape. I mean, my God, this is a real crowded class and, they, and everybody has what I consider to be a very competitive vehicle. So the Kia has gotten kind of I don't know, push to the side, but it, it's not quite as well known as a lot of these other vehicles. But naturally, Kia wants to change that. And they've done that by looking at all the things that people like in a compact SUV and enhancing them, emboldening them, and just making it, uh, in its own way, kind of a unique package. And we'll start with what's under the hood, because that's always the most interesting part where they actually have a smaller displacement engine than 2023, but it uh, generates 20 more horsepower, which for a small engine, for a small vehicle, is quite a boost indeed. So let's take a look under there and see what in the world they've been up to. Wow, four cylinders, 1.6 liter displacement, and turbocharging. And all this has uh, taken what used to be a uh, two liter 175 horsepower power plant and bumped it up to 195 horsepower at a peak of 6,000 RPM. And a torque, I love this, it's the same number. And your torque on this engine is 195 foot-pounds uh, available for anywhere from 1,500 RPM all the way to 4,500 RPM. 
peak. So nice, huh? Uh, let's look at this layout here. What we got here is your air box going in here. It goes to the back where, of course, our turbocharger's down there. Boy, it's hot, hot there, hot, hot. And uh, it comes around, and if you look straight down here, you can probably tell there's a huge hose that goes down in here, and that's where the cool air from the intercooler uh, meets up with your turbocharged uh, compressed air supply and it cools it because you don't want the air hot you want the air cold whenever possible and then it feeds into the intake system right here which is direct fuel injection and you got spark plugs where are your spark plugs at one two three four right back there so it's a very compact engine and one of the things it reminded me of uh, initially is the fact that like the Honda CRV, there's a lot of room underneath here to work uh, to work on stuff, and the uh, it does have belts. <laughs> belts are over on the left hand side, so this is the front of the engine mounted transversely that way. So you have an awful lot of power coming out of a very small engine. Uh, 1.6 liters is is tiny, but it uh, it seems to be pretty. We'll talk a lot about power delivery as I drive the car because it uh, it's it's interesting. It's a little different in some ways. Here's our 12 volt battery. And uh, our oil flavor is 0W20, which is very common, which is great. Easy to get, you can get that damn near anywhere. It's a very common type of oil where companies like Toyota are going to like 016, 08 in the case of the Crown. This is a good old 020, which is very common and very easy to get. So what about our transmission? Well, it's an eight speed. And uh, it's a conventional type of transmission. There, there's, depending on the model of the Celtos you get, and this, of course, is your top of the line SX. Uh, they have a few different. They have a couple of di different gearboxes that come with it. But this is, for all intents and purposes that I can tell, is a conventional automatic transmission, and seems to fit pretty well with this uh, particular configuration. And the engine itself seems to be very smooth, very tractable. Uh, it's a it's a real real nice engine, but uh, there is some there is not an issue but something a characteristic I should say of it that I'm not real fond of, and we'll talk about that at length when we're actually driving the car. But there you go, it's pretty much uh, de rigueur for these days, a four cylinder turbocharged engine of small displacement that actually puts out a healthy amount of horsepower, just shy of 200 horsepower and just shy of 200 pounds of feet in your torque department. Well, you would think that somebody like me would might bother to do a little detail work and clean this wheel up. Well, I'm sorry. The weather was, uh, we got a lot of rain last night and there's mud everywhere. So anyway, although the back tire didn't look good. Well, anyway, uh, here in our Celtos, we have a very nice Kumho Majesty 9 tire, which is a 235-45 R18. So you got 18 inch wheels of this incredibly neat geometric design that Kia does really well. They, a lot of the wheels on a lot of their cars are very, very good. They're, they're not, you're not just getting, the, the car may not be all that expensive, but you're getting very expensive looking wheels, which is kind of nice. And these are very good, high quality uh, Kumho tires too. They're your, your M plus S, so they are good for four season comfort, provided that you don't have, the snow is not too deep and the mud is not too deep, you're in good shape. But it's a, it's a real nice uh, tire for this car because it seems to be doing everything well, including it's probably got a fairly low rolling resistance, which helps the fuel mileage. I do like the black on the white. I, of all the uh, Celtos, Celtos eyes I've looked at, I'm real fond of this particular paint scheme because I think it really suits it with all the black detail and everything else. Let's take a look, shall we? Look at here. It may be a little compact, but it's got a very nice power lift gate. And within, we have a very nicely furnished cargo area. Uh, it's big enough for, I would say, about 1.5 suitcases. That would be my, that would be my uh, belief. And you also have your 60-40 fold-down seats to increase your cargo room right there. Lift over height is not too bad. It's actually, everybody's doing this now. It's about uh, mid-thigh, what I would say. 
You know. Oh, what do we have here? Oh, <gasps> secret compartment. Shoot. Oh yeah. No, it's no secret. It's a spare tire, a nice temporary spare tire, with all the various uh, condiments you need with your spare your spare tire changing experience right on top there with your jack and all your other stuff and your your screw in uh, eye loop thing that if you ever need to have it towed or pulled out, you just screw that in and it goes right into a reinforced part of the subframe and therefore is more than adequate to safely pull you out of whatever situation you may be in. You know, there's a lot of room around this uh, compact spare tire, as you may be able to tell. I think you could probably get a full size if you were so inclined. Some parts of the world, that might be a real good idea. And when you buy the car, you say, I'll tell you what, I got, I'll, I'll agree to this price, but you guys got to put a full size spare in there for it and see what they say. They'll probably tell you they can't do that, but who knows. But there you go. Very, very reasonably sized cargo area. Not the best. Again, there's nothing about this vehicle that I would call, in my personal belief, best in class. But it is a very good vehicle for the money, especially. But it has, as so typical with a lot of Kias, it has a lot of features for the money. And that's what you want, after all, when you're looking for a car, especially one like this. One of the most useful family cars you can get is a compact SUV. And they can actually uh, do everything you need that you may ask of it and still get good mileage, which is so critical these days. Shall we check the interior? I think we will. How do you drive a car that's called a Kia? That's right, it's the sound of automotive music. Uh, so, Seltos, what have we to examine? Well, what we have is a flat screen instrument cluster becoming all the thing these days with uh, the appearance of analog instrumentation to a certain extent. Now, what can we do with this particular analog situation? Well, let's see what I can figure out here. If we go to vehicle, beep. It's not exactly lightning fast, this uh, particular thing. Cluster theme selection, okay. So uh, right now we're sitting on classic A. This is your classic A situation. You can also link this to the drive mode as is typical Kia and Hyundai practice. Let's look at classic B. Ooh, it's uh, a little more white on the left hand side. <laughs> and then classic C, which is probably what ends up if you go into eco mode. Now, what are our drive modes? Well, let's see. We have sport, smart, and normal. There is no eco mode. Look at that. Huh. But if you go to, now, if I link this to the drive mode, this is normal. This is sport, which is not as red as I would have expected. And then smart is just uh, kind of uh, smart in its uh, smartness. Huh. Well, anyway, I'm going to stick with, uh, I'm going to stick, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stick with classic A. Disconnect that, disconnect this, put that in, and we'll go with the classic, the classic maneuver. Uh, what do we have on this side? Well, we can also have a beautiful tachometer, which I much prefer. Now, why it does that, oh, it's, it's giving me, you know, it's, it's not going to do that unless it's giving me something to say. Here we have... Uh, a situation where we can determine what's going on with our torque vectoring all-wheel drive. Because, and you may ask yourself, what does it mean by torque vectoring? Well, it, it means it, it vectors the torque, doesn't it? Um, it? It is another one of these new all-wheel drive systems that uses the all-wheel drive to enhance handling in any condition, not just in slick conditions where you just need to get out of a rut. Or, or get along in a relatively straight line in the snow or the mud. Uh, it also is used to enhance the handling and traction in dry situations. So what it does is it transfers the torque where it can do the most good in terms of overall traction and overall balance of the car. So pretty sophisticated. It all depends upon the sophistication of the algorithms because it's the, the primary sensor all these all-wheel drive systems uses 
is the same sensor that goes into your uh, anti-lock braking system, which are wheel speed sensors. But there's other things at play here. There's so much more information available to the uh, uh, computer processing unit, your CPU, and since it has so much information it can look at, it can enhance how the drivetrain works simply by applying all that information to optimize your traction. So that's basically what's going on with that. Um, what else do we have here? We have our, that's uh, if you have your cruise control on, that's uh, your settings. Oops. And uh, since refueling, we've gone 85 miles, and they're saying I'm getting 27.7 miles per gallon. Now, it may be, uh, we'll see ultimately what the true miles per gallon gets, but it's an amazing thing. Even though this has a really small engine, a 1.6 liter turbocharged engine, uh, you discover with a lot of these cars that they still have a real hard time breaking the 30 mile per gallon uh, barrier that all compact. I, I feel like all compact uh, crossover US uh, crossover utility vehicles seem to aspire to. Uh, and they end up where? In the mid to upper 20s in terms of your fuel economy. Now the hybrids do much, much better, obviously. But um, in terms of this, the general uh, normally non-electrical intervent, uh, uh, non-electric, why don't I try, trying to put this? Those that don't have any kind of an electric motor associated with the drivetrain at all. How about that? Uh, have a hard time getting, actually, to be honest with you, above about 25 miles per gallon. So even when you have a very small turbocharged engine, which one of the goals of having that turbocharging is to increase your overall fuel economy, which it does a little bit. Uh, if you drive the car, though, <laughs> you, you go up hills and things like that, and the turbocharger actually comes into play a fair amount. Uh, your mileage is not that much of an improvement, if any. So I just think that's interesting that you can almost set your watch by the fact that you're going to get uh, around 25 miles per gallon. This, this car will do a little better because it's actually, when I say compact, it's very compact. And it's a, it's a pretty light machine. And uh, matter of fact, do I have, I may even have the curb weight. Let's, let's have a look here. And my notes. There's my notes. Do I have a curb weight? Uh, hang on, you're being very patient. I appreciate it. Yes, 3,362 pounds. So this is a light vehicle. Uh, but anyway, that's the, uh, that's the bulk of what we have for our uh, instrument cluster. And the choice is there too. Now, it almost looks like it's all part of one thing here. But your uh, central touchscreen right there, look at that. It's like it's almost one thing. It isn't. These are two different screens. But they've blended them together using the the incredible uh, creative powers that they have in their design and engineering department to make it look like it's almost one big thing and soon they will be probably every car is just going to have one big flat screen which um, has advantages and disadvantages I'll just put it that way uh, but anyway our central display screen is a very nice uh, landscape affair and what, what settings do we have well let's go to map now this particular, I complain about this a lot. I, I am not a huge fan of uh, these white screens, these bright white screens. And usually, with most vehicles, it's very easy to change it over to a nighttime setting and just keep it there. So that way you have a black background with uh, white roads and everything else. on. My, I find it, my eyes find it much, much easier to see and far less fatiguing to look at. But this particular vehicle, as near as I can tell, does not have that option. Uh, it will increase and decrease brightness depending on the ambient. And there's a sensor here in the interior that detects the ambient light and adjusts accordingly. But it's still, I would like to have the option of not having that uh, white screen at all and going with. I, everybody seems to be doing, going that direction. I'm not sure why. Maybe people in general like it more, but it's more in terms of what the engineers like, and what they think is better. So that's, that's where you are. Uh, now as we, we meander south, naturally right here is where exactly where you would expect it is the climate control system. And like with pretty much everybody else, you have a, uh, this doesn't have a zone setting as near as I can tell. It, it does not. It is just a main temperature setting for the car. 
which you can set and put it on automatic and the uh, heating ventilation air conditioning system will attempt to maintain that particular temperature as best it can. Some are better at this than others. Uh, this one's not bad. It does a pretty good job for the most part. Setting, I set it at 68. That's where I normally put it. Just so you know, if you're going to give me a car, uh, you might want to set it to 68 uh, when you deliver it. But <clears throat> Anyhow, uh, below here is our main, this is very convenient to the touch screen, like our navigation system, which gives you all the different options that you have in your navigation system. Places of interest, previous destinations, uh, if Kia dealerships, you know, let's, let's, go, let's go there. Where's the closest Kia dealership? Columbia Kia. I actually know the owner of that place. Uh, that's very close. That's, that's not far away. So what else do we have? We have... Uh, and naturally a search fun function and traffic. Traffic is great because this is telling me uh, where there's l lanes, closings, and all kinds of things. That's a very nice little database to have. Uh, you're hoping that most of this information is on the map itself, which I would assume it probably is. We'll check that out later when we're out on the road, but I'm pretty sure it is. So, what else do we have? Well, oh, this is interesting. Huh, I didn't realize you could just do that. But look at here. Here's a map. Yeah, and it's basic. Well, there's my dark screen. <laughs> there's, there's the dark screen I like so much. It's over here. It's, uh, well, who knew? Um, so anyway, where were we? Oh, yes. We were heading south from our climate control into this particular cubby area here. Now, way up here, right up on top of this, that is your QI charger for your cell phone. And it seems to handle my Apple iPhone with the OtterBox Defender case on it just fine. Just put it in there and it charges away. I'm, I'm very pleased with how that works. Um, hearing that, Toyota? You listening? Hmm? Uh, and then we have our uh, USB, conventional USB-A and USB-C ports for your convenience. And a 12-volt port for plugging in various electric accessories you may have. Right there. Then we go to our drive mode switch, which is right here, which you've seen. It's very straightforward. Uh, it, working in cahoots with this, it does not have like an off-road or a snow setting per se, but what it does have is a uh, center differential lock. So if things get really slick and you're plowing your way through some uh, mud and stuff like that on an unimproved trail in the forest, you can uh, turn that on and this will ensure that you're getting... Uh, the power going to all four wheels all the time, which is very, very valuable. Very common these days, too. Something else that is not common for a lot of compact SUVs is uh, having heating seats, yes, but ventilation, no, it's not all that common, but it's getting there. I'm starting to see it on more and more what I would call lower trim. This is a very top trim rating. But uh, just the car itself, having it available is terrific because that is... As hot as it's been and as hot as it's going to stay, that is such a nice feature to have to keep you comfortable while you're driving. Then we have our, our camera button, and look at there. There's our rear camera. What Do we have choices? We sure do. We have this kind of a wide angle -y thingy, and then we have uh, this one, which is more focused, straight down, like where's my trailer hitch? I think that's what that is. Is that what that is? Is this the bumper right here? Yes, it is. So that's if you do have a trailer hitch. Wow, how convenient. How wonderfully convenient. And then there's this. No, that's that one. And what about that one? So we have the same thing twice. <laughs> I don't understand the difference. Well, this one, though, is your, is your conventional rear. There we go. Not bad. Not bad at all. And over on the right here, you have a 360 type of situation where, uh, oh, what's this tell us? Extended rear view mar and rear view parking lines. You can take those out if you don't like them. Nice. It's always nice to have choices, to have the ability to modify your situation. So uh, now if we actually put the car in reverse, what happens? Hmm. Yeah, we still have our uh, GPS map on the right-hand side. I don't understand that. I'd, I'd go with the whole screen being the back uh, camera, but then again, they know what they're doing. I think. Anyway, here's our uh, hill descent, which uh, handles the braking for you. If you're going down a very steep trail, let's say, 
uh, and you'd like to concentrate on steering the car and not be worried about braking it so that you don't suddenly go zooming down the hill, that will help take care of that for you. And it's usually uh, downhill brake control is on and off. Uh, I don't think it has an actual uh, adjustment so you can adjust the speed that you're going, but it'll keep you from going excessively fast. So, okay, for the back, what do we have? <gasps> we have a nice little cubby, fairly deep, not huge, but there is in fact room to put some items. And our glove box is actually a very generously sized glove box that yes, you can get like a traditional iPad in. Uh, keep it there if you want. Uh, look at the look at the neatness of our Bose sound system speaker. It's got kind of a geometric thing going on there. Uh, it's uh, the, that kind of angularity is very common as a styling and design thing on this particular Seltos, as is all Kias. They uh, they're very big on having kind of a unique look and design that I think is is quite pleasing and quite clever. Uh, overall, and it gives it uh, the car a very individual personality. Now over here, what do we have? Well, we have a power lift gate, which is nice. We have your traction control disconnect, and then that's your, just your rheostat for your lighting to lower the lighting down and bring it back up. Oh, that's fun. I enjoy that. So, this is our front seats, and our uh, I believe it's called uh, something Tex. This particular, it's again, it's synthetic leather, and you'd swear it's leather, but it's not. And uh, it's nicely perforated to aid that wonderful seat ventilation that you have. And this is kind of a suede insert type thing as well. It's not suede. It, what is it? I think it's slightly different material than the side material. Ah, it's hard to say. But these are very comfortable seats, and they offer excellent support. Uh, that is the lighting, by the way. That is not the actual. That's not the actual uh, finish on the seating material. Uh, it looks kind of like a crazy uh, skitter mash of color. No, no, no. It's actually a monotone, but it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like this right right here. Anyway, I, I hate to uh, put out stuff there that's inaccurate, like most of my imagery. Um, now we have a very nice uh, sunroof. Oops, sorry. And it's not a panorama, but it's a very nice sunroof. It's a, it's a good opening, as far as I'm concerned. I love having a sunroof of some type, always, because there's just, it, just, it really enhances the feeling of airiness, as if this car needs it. This car has boatloads of headroom. It's way up there. Can you see how far up this is? This is way above my head. I mean, this is for this is a tall person's car. You could do very, very well in this car if you're a tall person. So, all right, let's go back and see what our rear seat situation looks like. Moderately sized door. Door opens almost 90 degrees. And our uh, door opening is fairly generous. If you're a person of my stature, which is not overly large, I'm about five and a half plus two inches tall. Uh, but again, just like in the front, excellent, excellent headroom. Uh, you have a moder moderately sized drive shaft tunnel here, and but very good uh, foot room and leg room. It's not bad. You also sit, it seems like just a tad higher than the front seats. I wouldn't call it like stadium seating, but it's just a hair taller perhaps. And that's always nice because it kind of gives you a, a, a feeling of that you have a more commanding uh, seating, seating position, which makes you just feel like you can see out of the car better. The, uh, the belt line on this is, is about average. It's right, right in the middle. It's not too high, not too low. It's perfectly what you would probably expect out of this car. And why I always get in these cars and these people turn off. Oops, sorry. There we go. Turn off the damn, I can't put the window down. And I still can't put the window down. What have I done now? Let's see, oh, that's unlocked. Okay, there's it. Let's try that. I better work. There we go. Almost 100%, but not quite. I'd say 94%. And, and, 
Do we have map lights? We sure do. Oops, how do you turn these on? How do you turn this on here? There's got to be a way. There must be a way. There we go. Oh, I see. It's, uh, it's got two bulbs. Sorry about that. Now we got two bulbs here, but they come on simultaneously, so I don't think you can do the individual route. Yeah, that's fine. If this person over here on the right is trying to sleep and you want to read your book, uh, they're going to be incommoded by that. I just want to say. Uh, I was just in another vehicle seconds ago. It, it will be in a different video. But I was making a big deal out of the fact that it seems very common that you have a pocket for putting your, uh, like your, your pad tablet thingy or your magazine or maybe a semi-skinny book. But you only have that pocket behind the passenger seat and the driver's seat doesn't have it. Well, the, the car I was in actually had a uh, pocket here. This does not, this is, and that's, that's normal. This is the, what, what you normally encounter. That's why I made a big deal about it in this other cat because it's kind of nice to have if you're a rear seat passenger and you're like me and you got all your stuff with you. You got all your paperwork, your contracts, your, uh, you know, whatever. Me, it's it's like instruction manuals for the vacuum cleaner, that kind of stuff. So interesting that the, I, someday someone will, an engineer will explain to me about why there is no pocket usually behind the driver, because I don't get that. Now, again, we have this excellent synthetic leather that is, it's, it, the rear seating is firm but comfortable. It's, it's kind of bench-like, but it has a little bit more lower back support than a lot of vehicles do. Naturally, have a look at this armrest. I would say that is at a very good level. It's a hair higher than some, but actually it's about perfect. Very, very nice. You got your cup holders here, and you don't have a tr uh, ski through because you don't need one because you have your twin fold-down uh, fold down seats, you see. You can fold this down in 60, 40 increments to increase your cargo area to your rear hatch, which, as I mentioned, has a power lift gate. I think I've probably said that 19 times because you don't always find that in this class of vehicle. So anyway, plenty of room back here for two people, especially for a person who wants to wear their hat. And I'm telling you, hats are coming back, not baseball caps. I didn't say caps are coming back, hats. I think we're going to start seeing people wearing their uh, a Dante chapeau. I hope so. Anyway, I like hats. So there you go. Very interesting, very Kia, and uh, a very practical little compact sport utility. You know, I do wish I could take this uh, Celto screen here and kick it down a notch, like put it in nighttime mode or something. I don't like these bright white screens. It must be me. But I find them more difficult, more fatiguing to read, but more, most importantly, they don't read well on the camera. <laughs> <clears throat> so, I, I'm trying to slot this uh, this particular Seltos in with all the rest of the compact SUVs, and it's kind of difficult because it it does in some ways feel uh, less refined than some of the best of them out there. Uh, but at the same time, it offers a lot of features for the money. And and one of the course, one of the most important things is how is the drivetrain? Well. This particular turbocharged engine, being a very sm very small engine, 1.6 liters in displacement, in line four, does kind of remind me of older turbocharged in line four gas engines, and that is kind of peaky. You start out doesn't seem to have boatloads of low end torque. I mean, most of them don't, but uh, although some of these engines will really surprise you. Uh, but this particular one seems to take a little bit of time to get spooled up in order to really put on the thrust. And then once you hit the power band, it's got a lot of power, but it's not, it seems more spiky than what's been done lately, including, uh, I'm absolutely including some other Kia offerings, uh, this particular engine, uh, which is brand new for this year. 
they went actually, they went from a two liter, uh, I believe normally aspirated, I think, as their top engine, to this 1.6 liter turbo. May have even been a two liter turbo, I don't know. But the fact of the matter is the smaller engine has more peak horsepower and, and torque. Uh, but like if you really get on it at lower RPMs, once it shifts, and uh, I have no problem with the transmission. Transmission shifts fine and has plenty of speeds. I believe she's an eight speed. And we do have a manual setting here. Let's see. Let's see what gear we're in. It just says S. <laughs> Wait a minute. There we go. Seven. Okay. I bet I can go to eight and, that, and then we'll be done. There's eight. No, that's it. Eight speed. There's eight speeds. Seven speeds. And back over to drive. So you don't have your paddle shifters, which is fine. Uh, but this eight speed transmission seems to be a pretty good fit for this engine. It seems to be able to put it in a uh, good torque area for the most part when the gear is selected. But you still have, like I said, compared to some, you don't have the low end torque that you would like to have ultimately. Uh, that's just that's just the uh, the nature of the beast. Turbochargers, all turbochargers need enough exhaust coming through the uh, turbine part to spin the impeller part that compresses the air part that gets goes through the intercooler part that then goes into the engine. So Manufacturers have come up with all kinds of clever ways to uh, get the turbo spinning as soon as possible and to move as much air at the lowest possible uh, RPM of the engine in order to give you that low end power. And it's not easy to do and, and it's, uh, the main part about it is expense. You can absolutely do that but it costs you more money to do it that way. That's just the nature of the beast. And we'll take around this corner here. Whee! It doesn't feel top heavy, even though it's a very tall vehicle, considering uh, the wheelbase and the stance. It's a fairly tall vehicle and has lots of headroom. But it doesn't feel overly top heavy. It certainly doesn't feel like a sedan but it's certainly not bad and seems to handle it well. I mean, you really, really push it and yeah, you'll get some body lean and you'll definitely feel the, uh, let's just say the upper superstructure of the body because it is taller than on your sedans. But overall, it's good. Alrighty then. There's a fair amount of, I think, the predominant contributor to the cabin noise level is wind, I think. Oh my God, it's a deer fly. Get out of here, deer fly. Now I'll open the window here, see if you can go outside. Do you know the change in the ambiance? I don't have a little uh, wind protector screen on this particular microphone. I hope he left. I tell you, those deer flies, they pack a wallop when they bite you. They just, they make mosquitoes look like little pipers. And it, they, they, what I mean by little piper is your, uh, your deer fly is more like your stealth fighter. It's got that delta wing set up. And boys, they can, ah, the sting is unpleasant. If you get enough of them on you, you could go mad. Mad, I tell you. Hope you're enjoying our little back road foray. Foar, far, foray? Far, soiree. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seltos on a soiree. This is a soiree of Seltos. I'm still working on i got to look that name up, find out where it comes from. But I'm uh, more than happy to uh, just make up what I think the word actually where it comes from. It's the name of a drug. Seltos. 
People that need to house nine passengers should not use cell toes. Whee! Ah, it's just me. You know, they're, they're, it varies dramatically in my interpretation duties in terms of uh, whether or not you got a lot of top heaviness. And you don't really. But it depends on what you just drove. Like if you just drove one of them um, Jeep Wranglers that just went by, well, hell, I just that's they have their own personality. It's, it's the tin box personality, and you you never really know. They they did so much years ago because they were there were so many incidents of people rolling them that this and this is a good while ago that they dramatically increased the stance on the vehicle. And that has made them much, much more stable on the road. They'll still roll over pretty easy, but nothing compared to the old days. It's a strange quirk of nature that if a vehicle has got a nice short wheelbase and a nice tight track makes it suitable for off-road work, it's not the world's greatest thing on the highway. How about that? What a shock. And yet there are people that compromise and do the best they can to make sure that it's competent in both arenas. And they've done a good job. But for the rest of us, the ones that spend most of their time on the pavement, a crossover SUV, such as the Seltos, is a better choice. Now let's see here, get some body lift. See what I mean about the, uh, it just, boom, power comes on. But there's that little lag what RPM are we? Yeah, we're, we're still at pretty low RPM here. Let's see if it... Uh, yeah, it needs to spin up a bit. It needs to get, I think, over about 2,500 RPM before you really get the push on. I don't have charts. I need charts for this particular engine. It'd be nice if the manufacturers always supplied that. They uh, never do. Look at our torque curve, unless they're unusually happy with it. Like I know uh, some of these V6 twin turbo pickups, uh, they're very proud of their torque curve coming on as low as it does. I think the, the, the winner of that is, uh, I think the Tundra engine. The 3.5 liter, they call it, which is actually a 3.4 liter. It, uh, it does come on pretty quick. And then, and then when you get the, the uh, iForce Max, the, the hybridized version that has the electric motor, that fills in even more in the back. That's what that thing is mainly, the hybrid part of that is mainly for, is to fill in that lower patch before the turbos really get spinning up. So any way you look at it, you have a nice abundant low end torque, which is exactly what you need for towing. It's great to have that. And if it can maintain it for a lot widespread of power, and that's, that is another thing I have to say that's pretty good about a lot of turbochargers is once they do hit that torque peak, they tend to stay there for a while so that you get that good, decent power delivery. Of course, the more you're spinning up the turbo, the more fuel the vehicle uses. Did you know that? Yeah, y'all know that. That's why, uh, I've mentioned this before, but that's why they, they kind of make good police vehicles because police vehicles spend most of their time idling, just sitting there idling. And if you have a smaller displacement engine, it uses less fuel at idle, running all the electronics. And then if they need to skitter away quickly, you have the, the boost that the turbo gives you, so you got a real fast acceleration and top speed also. So they do well. It's, it's not a bad choice at all for a police car, if you're so inclined. What do you say we, uh, what do you say we challenge? We challenge. Go away. There you go, there you go. See, look at there, look at all that space out there. Go, go. There we go, go. He's just sitting right there. He's, look at, he's clinging to the, there we go. Had to give him a little push. Don't know why. God, deer flies, my nemesis. All right. This is what we're going to try to do here, a little challenging activity here. We are going to, on this rural road, which is the ultimate test of your adaptive cruise control slash lane tracing. Come on now. There we go. 
Oh, it doesn't want to trace the lane here. There, now we're green. Okay. Car is in semi-autonomous mode. Now it's being challenged. Oh, is this person going to turn left all of a sudden? No, they put on their brakes and changed their mind. Oh, throwing huge, huge obstacles in the adaptive cruise control. And it's, the car is steering itself very nicely. Kias, I have noted, and I, you should note this too, for your notes. Uh, they seem to have a system, and I don't know if it's exactly the same as Hyundai's system or not. You would think it would be, since Hyundai's like the parent company. But the fact of the matter is, uh, their adaptive cruise control seems to work quite well. Better than a lot of other manufacturers. It seems to be able to read the road better, and who knows, they might be using something very simple like a different size lens, which can make, believe it or not, it can make a big, big difference. And it's one of the things that they test and they experiment with, and they do all these different things to try to figure out what will be best. Boy, this, uh, this cruise control is doing very nicely. And look, with, even with the turns in the road, the autonomous, which by the way, this is the kind of road that we're on that you really shouldn't be using lane tracing or anything like that. The reason is there's all kinds of things on a road like this. You have people checking their mail, stopping in their mailbox all of a sudden. You have people coming out of hidden driveways all the time. You have deer. You have giant, huge, hulking, snapping turtles. You got them. Then they got the squirrels. You don't want to run over the squirrels. I mean, they're squirrels. Don't run over them. But you got all these different things, so your computer will work better than this computer about seeing all these things. And some of the engineers will argue with that. They'll say, no, no. The system we're using, beta 19. Beta 19 is much faster than... No, it's not. It's not as fast as the human system that we have with our eyes and our perception. I'm real impressed with how this uh, cruise control does under these difficult... Ah, look, suddenly turning right. How are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? It's open now. You can accelerate. Watching for surround... Watch for surrounding vehicles. Isn't that something? It realized there were surrounding vehicles and then it accelerated. I'm telling you. Kia's got this part down. They do good work. I think I know that guy. I think he's a neighbor, actually. Boy, he's a long way from home. And here's, here's an upper. Look at this. It's wiggling. It's wiggling. But it's still steering. Look at this. And there's another vehicle unexpected coming out of nowhere this is one thing about summertime up here is we have and they've for some reason the powers that be have done an absolutely awful job at mowing this year i don't know why granted the grass has been growing like crazy we've gotten more rain i think we have we we got more rain in july than we've gotten ever uh, since that we've been uh, man has been measuring it here in this area <laughs> that's a lot of rain and uh, naturally it this is the time of year where the grass just goes nuts anyway because it only has so many months that it can thrive. And so, but I'm telling you, it's making, making driving a little bit more difficult and it's making the work of anybody that's on a bicycle or jogging or anything like that much more problematic because I'm going to turn off the self-steering now. It did very well. Uh, it, it's a lot more dangerous when you have all this because you can't move over onto the just off the pavement a little bit when cars are coming as easily You're, you have to plow through grass to do that I mean it's nuts man it's crazy it's crazy time I don't know if I approve I don't approve are you gonna turn right you gonna turn right you gonna turn right yeah we'll turn right this person has no idea where they're going I can always tell See what I mean? Wah, wah. What is that car that's got that end button? <laughs> I believe that's a Hyundai that has the end button. And I, I got chastised by somebody in the video I did on that, whatever car that was. I believe that was your uh, stealthy little three-door 
Hyundai Coupe. We do not say its name. But it, it was an N series and it had an N button. And you press the N button and it just all hell goes, breaks loose. It's, it, it's like they, they will really, when you, you press the N button, it will go within an inch of its life spinning around in craziness to get you, get you down the road in an exhilarating manner. I haven't had anything that's this peaky in a while. Um, another thing I like about supercharging that I had a Raptor R, which I have not yet put on the channel. I'm going to very soon. Well, maybe I have. No, I have. It's on there. Uh, but it has a, a nice big V8 that's supercharged. And uh, it's probably, the, the, from a gas consumption point of view, is one of the worst pieces out there. But it is fun. I mean, that's what it's designed for. It's a toy, basically. And it goes really well and really smoothly and real linear delivery of power. We're going to come up on one of my favorite turns for testing because it's an off-camber right turn into a hill situation. And it tells you a lot. But like I say, there is road noise too, but it seems to me like the primary thing that you are dealing with with this vehicle is wind noise. I think that's that's the thing more than anything else. Anybody want that one of them Ram trucks? That's for sale right there. That's for sale for you. And it's not it's not an annoying. It's not to the point of being annoying. The the. Uh, interior noise but it's definitely louder than a lot of the best out there like say the parent company's uh tucson is it the tucson i was yeah because the i got it i got it now the taos is a volkswagen but the tucson is a hyundai <laughs> which town when will your town be named after an suv huh be patient they're coming for you People that want to tow a one million pound trailer should not use Seltos. I swear I think it's some kind of pharmaceutical, uh, the Seltos. Still haven't looked up that, uh, I, I, I need to do that. I need to look up that name, find out where it comes from. But here we have our rear suspension on our Seltos. And as you can see, it's a very, I would call fairly conventional uh, rear suspension of independent variety with a upper control arm and what do we have in the upper uh excuse me a lower control arm and an upper control arm up in there that you can see outboard outboard mounted shock absorber nice little cute cool spring right there it's beautiful um and there's these these things here which are uh, uh those are the those are your lower spring uh things davits whatever uh, but as you can see here, we have our, uh, we have sort of a leading link and we have a t upper link and then we have a, a very conventional lower, uh, link that is attached to a very substantial looking subframe and which is then uh, attached to the unibody itself. And our rear differential is right here. It is a conventional uh, unit and right next to it oh this is good this is our actuator here that this is what this p p piece of electric wonder right here is what actually turns and locks in the rear drive system uh, so that you can zoom on your way in all-wheel drive and there's a little drive shaft right up in there that you can see comes in here then that is completely disconnected except when this tells it to activate and lock up in here so you have your rear wheel drive system activated. And you have a switch where you can lock that on when uh, the going really gets super slippery or rugged or whatever the situation may be, you have that to gain traction. You can also see here that we have a, a fair amount of protection underneath here and it's not just the softest, well, I can't really tell. But it's, it's a fairly soft variety. It's not gonna protect you from large boulders and rocks, 
But most uh, light off-road debris that uh, is the kind of thing that you would probably run into uh, with a vehicle like this on your forest roads and that kind of thing, it's pretty well protected from that. And it has a, a much more substantial skid plate up front that you can see there. Uh, so, all in all, it's a very sturdy yet, uh, oh, there's a much better, there we go. There's a much better look at that front link right there. And then you have the, this cantilevered uh, locator right there that goes into it. So it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, way of doing things because it's got a lot of pieces to it uh, just to isolate the rear wheel. But overall, the ride is fine. It's not, <clears throat> it's not anything I would be, uh, for example, if you uh, compare it, to the Telluride. The Telluride has an amazingly smooth ride. This type of suspension is not that much different than uh, what's on the Telluride. In fact, it's very similar. But the, I think more than anything else, the Telluride isolates from the unibody better than this does. But like I say, this is <clears throat> there's nothing really wrong with the way the suspension works on this vehicle. It's, it's just pretty typical for the class. It's not outstanding. But for, for most people that would buy this kind of vehicle, you have all this good ground clearance. Uh, you have a fair amount of traffic. Uh, traffic. <sighs> why, I always say that when I'm trying to say travel. I don't know why that is. But this particular wheel is nearly off the ground, while this one is highly compressed. So you do have a fair amount of travel. It's not the best, but it's not the worst either. It's real close to being off the ground there, but not too bad. So... There you are. That's your Kia Seltos undersides for your entertainment. Alrighty then, the 2024 Seltos SX Turbo all-wheel drive, there is a two-wheel drive version of the Seltos of course, has a base price of $29,990 and with options, our sticker came to $33,085, quite a bargain for a fine little SUV in a very competitive class. Now, I'm gonna finally reveal why it's called the Seltos, I, I think. It's actually named after uh, a, a god named Seltos, or the son of Hercules, actually, which was spelled slightly differently, but we believe that is from where it comes from. So it's about a myth. <laughs> it's, it's a mythic name. And if you're into mythic names, the Seltos is for you. It's a really nice car though, folks. Uh, if you're in this class of vehicle and you want something that's a little more affordable, give it a look. And be careful while you're out on the road. We'll see you next time. Do whatever the tube tells you. You dress like the tube. You eat like the tube. You raise your children like the tube. You even think like the tube. This is mass madness, you maniacs. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion.